Stack buffer overflows, what are those? Well, it's when you have too much ACID data being copied from attacker's data into a vulnerable buffer on the stack. So for instance, if we had a mem copy and it had an attacker controlled length and an attacker controlled data, then an attacker could cause an overflow of this vulnerable buffer. Basically, you know, whatever the size of that buffer is, if the attacker controls the size, then they can just keep increasing the size until they ultimately exceed the bounds of the buffer. So if this means something to you right now, good, great, you know, hopefully that was enough for you. But if it wasn't, let's go ahead and cover some background before we come back to the slide again later. So first of all, what is the stack? Well, the stack can refer to a fundamental data structure type. So if you think of things like linked lists or queues, stack is another type of data structure. Specifically, it's a data structure where it's called first in, last out. It's basically like a stack of plates. So you put a plate onto the stack and you put another plate onto the stack and you just keep putting them on the top of the stack. And so the first data that you put in is going to be at the bottom of the stack and you're not gonna be able to get to that plate. You can't pull it out from underneath. You have to pop data off the top of the stack in order to get access to that earlier data. So in this class, when we refer to the stack, we're not going to be referring to the data structure, but rather a region of memory that behaves like that sort of data structure. So in the memory area that's allocated for an executing program or a kernel or firmware or anything else, if we imagine things with low addresses low and high addresses high, there might be some area that's reserved for the code that's gonna execute. And then there's an area that is reserved for the stack. There's also an area reserved for the heap. And so we say that the stack you know, grows towards low addresses. So basically the stack is effectively upside down in this sort of picture. So basically the top of the stack here and it continues to grow towards lower addresses and the heap generally grows towards higher addresses. So in the context of C programs, the stack is used to store temporary data, most importantly, things like local variables. That's where the buffer that's going to overflow is going to be stored. So if we look at just some simple code here, you might recognize some things like, okay, this refers to globals, buff one and buff two. These are outside of a function, they must be globals. You might see this buff three that's inside of a function that looks like a local variable. And then you see that this malloc is being used to allocate eight bytes of memory from the heap and take the pointer and store it into this buff four. So where are all of these things stored and you know which piece is used in using the stack? So for instance, these buff one and buff two, these are globals and they're not going to be on the stack. They're going to be in special global areas. So for instance, there it turns out there's different areas typically for zero initialized global variables, buff one in this case, and also there are areas for non-zero initialized global variables. So buff two is set to zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and therefore it's going to go into a different memory region. Now buff three and buff four are what we're gonna care about in this section. These are local variables and local variables are stored on the stack. So buff three is going to be eight bytes allocated on the stack and buff four is going to be whatever the pointer width is. If it's 32 bit system, it's 32 bits. If it's a 64 bit system, it's 64 bits. And then this malloc is going to allocate eight bytes of memory on the heap. It's going to return a pointer to that memory and it's going to store it into the local variable buff four, which is on the stack. So buff four is on the stack, the data it points to is on the heap. So we could visualize that like this. Buff one is zero initialized and there's a special area for zero or uninitialized global memory. Buff two on the other hand, because it was initialized is going to go into a special area for globals that are initialized. And I'm actually showing this in green the same way as code here, just to kind of indicate that typically because you have specific initialization, those specific values are gonna be compiled into the binary on disk. So all of this green stuff came from the actual compiled binary on disk, whereas this pink stuff is actually just allocated at execution time. But again, the part that we really care about is this buff three and buff four. These are local variables and they exist on the stack. So buff three will be eight bytes of data on the stack. Buff four is a pointer on the stack and it points to, after this malloc, like initially it points to nothing, but after the malloc, it points to these eight bytes on the heap. But before we get too much into this, we need to establish some conventions that we're going to use for diagrams in this class. If you see gray, that is meant to indicate it is uninitialized data. Blue is initialized. Red is acid, attacker controlled input data. And blue transitioning into red means that it's semi-attacker control data or sassy data. 
Now, you will see that there are frequent cases where an attacker may not exactly control everything about the data, but still, even with SASE data instead of ACID data, an attacker can still achieve their goals most of the time. So if this was 64 bytes, then when we're drawing it as a stack diagram, we will place low addresses low and high addresses high. This is a convention that's common in computer architecture books and is also used in other OST2 classes. Now, in this convention, if we assume that we've got a little endian architecture, we're going to draw the little end or the least significant byte here to the right and the big end or most significant byte to the left. Okay, well, we know that a stack data structure has data growing from the bottom of the stack to the top of the stack. And therefore, with our low addresses low and high addresses high convention, we're going to be seeing the stack growing downward. So eight bytes at a time, for instance, on a 64-bit architecture are typically pushed onto the stack, and that means it's going to grow towards progressively lower things, and the thing at the lowest address is the top of the stack, and the thing at the top of the diagram is the bottom of the stack. All right, so stack grows towards low addresses, but memory writes grow towards high addresses. So any sort of write is going to overwrite this direction going up on this diagram in this orientation. So for instance, if we had a 64 byte buffer, uh, the indexing, which is going to be used on our stack diagrams is index zero, index one, et cetera, all the way up through index 63 up here at the top. And so if we had some value like hex 11223344, et cetera, if this was a little endian architecture, meaning the least significant byte is here on the right and the most significant byte is here on the left, then we would convert this eight individual bytes, if we were interpreting it as a keyword or a unsigned long long, uh, that would be interpreted as an eight byte value of hex one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. So, you know, this is just uh, trying to remind us, you know, how little Indian this works on architectures. On the other hand, if you had something like a string instead of a number, well, the least significant byte of a string is over here. So slash H-O-M-E slash U-S-E-R. So this would, for instance, be the string slash home slash user slash SBO. So again, the little endianness means that it's going to go from the right to the left, bottom to the top in stack diagrams. Now, when it comes to what's going on behind the scenes, there's a variety of things that can be stored on the stack. And it's going to depend on the computer architecture, the calling conventions that are used by the particular compilers and code that's being compiled. And we cover this in other classes, such as assembly classes. For purposes of this class, the only thing that you really, really need to know is the fact that there is a return address generally stored on the stack somewhere on most architectures. Not necessarily in leaf functions, but pretty much every architecture is going to have something like a return address. And the return address is the address of code where code should return when you return out of a C function, right? So in C, we call a function in order to jump in and start executing the code. And when we're done with the function, we return back from that function. And so somewhere, somehow, the architecture has to store, like how do we get back to the place that we came from when this call was issued? And we call that the return address, which is stored on the stack. So if the stack is organized into like a sequence of frames for function one, calls function two, calls function three, then on our stack diagrams, the frames for earlier functions will be on the top and later functions and ultimately the leaf function will be on the bottom. And so again, there's a variety of things that could be on the stack and it really all just depends. But what I wanna say is that return address is going to be the very key and critical thing. This is what attackers are going to be trying to corrupt with stack buffer overflows. But there's also things like local variables and attackers can get a lot of benefit from corrupting local variables. There's saved registers in terms of callee and caller saved registers. Uh, there's function parameters on some architectures, which might get saved on the stack, and it could depend on how many uh, parameters are passed to a function and so forth. And then, you know, again, return addresses. So this is the type of things that we could have. I uh, left out uh, various things depending on architecture, but in general, all architectures are going to have this kind of stuff. And the one we really, really care about is that return address. That's going to be a good target for an attacker. So those are our conventions. Let's get back to it. What is a stack buffer overflow? It's when too much ACID data is copied into a stack buffer overflowing its bounds. So let's, you know, let's consider this, you know, visualize this. Let's say we had a mem copy and it's 
copying into vulnerable buffer. It's copying from asset buffer and it has an attacker controlled length. So this would look something like this. You're copying the data from here and it's flowing and it's flowing and eventually it's overflowing the bounds of the vulnerable buffer and it's consequently smashing the return address on the stack and that gives the attacker some benefit. They overwrite the return address and therefore when the function returns, it's going to go to some attacker controlled location. So what are the common causes of stack buffer overflows? Well, we've got two root causes. We've got the sweet potato and the carrot, these being the only roots available in the emoji set at the time. So in the sweet potato case, we've got unsafe or weakly bounded fu common functions like memcopy, string copy, string cat, sprintf, etc. These are things that typically, you know, are either explicitly for purposes of copying memory or, you know, implicitly doing things like string operations, which will lead to copying memory. There's also very frequently uh, wrappers where, you know, some programmer wants to do a custom mem copy that's just for their particular struct data type or something like that. And at the end of the day, they may be copying one struct to another struct, but behind the scenes, you know, it's usually backed by something like a mem copy. So you have to watch out for these sort of wrapper functions as well. Then we've got the other caret cause, which is sequential data writes within a loop that is an asset exit condition. So data writes, so right here means like it's copying, it's copying from one location to a different memory location, usually not with something like a mem copy, usually something just like, you know, assigning to uh, some dereferenced pointer or something like that. So you've got writes and they're within a loop. So it effectively is a memory copy operation. And when that loop exit condition is attacker controlled, that's when you're gonna get into problems because they can potentially control that loop to keep copying too much and ultimately overflow buffer. So let's see a trivial example of a stack buffer overflow. We're gonna see a whole bunch of real examples shortly, but you gotta always start with something trivial. So in this case, we have main, which is taking a argument count and an argument vector. And we've got buff, which is what? It's a stack buffer. It's a stack buffer because it's a local variable. And this buff is only eight bytes big, but we are going to use an unbounded string copy function to copy an arbitrary number of bytes from the one-th ar one argument of the arg vector, and that's going to be copied into buff. So that's just a arbitrary size string, could be 256 bytes, and that'll be copied into buff, which is only eight bytes. So which case is this? Which common root cause case is this? This is the sweet potato case. Sweet potato is these weakly bounded functions. So what does this look like when we visualize it? Here is our stack diagram visualization we're using by convention in this section. High address is high, low address is low, least significant byte to the right, most significant byte to the left. So when we have the argument vector initialized, it turns out that argv is stored somewhere on the stack. So this argv of zero is actually going to be sassy data as shown here. It's not completely attacker controlled because if we you know, put on our nerd glasses, and look at it very carefully, we would say that attacker cannot completely control this path because if they could, then that would mean they could put it anywhere on the system. And if they could do that, then that would suggest that they already had administrative rights. And if they had that, then on most Unix type systems, they've already won. So we're gonna say that it's sassy data. And in my particular case, I was running it from slash home slash user slash SPO. So argv0 by convention usually is going to be the path to the executable itself. And then argv1 is going to be the actual command line argument that's passed to that particular executable. Here now you can see that argv1 is completely attacker controlled input. So they can put whatever they want there. Then once other memory is initialized, we're just gonna give that a dot, dot, dot and say, you know, this exists somewhere on the stack. Some other stuff is going to be initialized. That's blue for initialized. And then finally, main is called. Now a side effect of calling a function, as we said before, is that you have the return address to get back to wherever you came from pushed onto the stack. And so even though you only wrote the main function inside of your code, something somewhere has to call and invoke that main. And that's something somewhere that return back out of main, whatever that function is, that's going to have the return address back to that function pushed onto the stack. Okay, so now we assume main has been called. First thing it does is it allocates space for that local variable, the buff eight. And so buff is eight bytes on the stack. 
that is going to be allocated but uninitialized. So it's just reserved, but it's not set to anything yet, and it just assumes that the code needs to initialize that at some point. Then next comes this dangerous string copy, and that's going to copy from argv1 to buff. And you can see that argv1 is bigger than buff, so what happens when we start that copy? Well, attacker controlled input gets put in, and oh no, it's smashing the stack for fun and profit. And the net result of that is that all of a sudden that return address, which was supposed to return back to whatever function called main, now points at an arbitrary attacker controlled value. And that means the attacker gets to return back to code anywhere they want on the system. Of course, it's ultimately up to the attacker to figure out where it is profitable to return to. And that's not the topic for this class. That would be a future exploitation class. In this class, we're just going to try to figure out where are these vulnerabilities that would allow these sort of attacks. So stack buffer overflows, you know, they're a very old type of vulnerability. Um, you know, it's not just the smashing the stack for fun and profit 1996 type old that I cited before. We're talking like 1980s old and really, you know, there's citations back to the, to the 70s. So, you know, the very first worm that was ever released on the proto internet, the ARPANET, uh, was the Morris worm released in 1988 and this was a stack buffer overflow vulnerability. It exploited a stack overflow in the finger daemon which would typically run on most Unix systems. It was a way of querying information about other users on the system. So this has been going on for a very long time and so the point here is of saying that's been going on for a very long time is that you know if everybody is still making these sort of mistakes in this day and age after you know, well more than 30 years, that means you know, it's not fundamentally the programmer's problem. It's the programming language problem. And that's why we're not trying to demonize people who make these sort of mistakes. Most people have never learned anything about them, so how could they know, you know not to have this kind of thing occurring? And so here we're really just trying to focus on how do we recognize these kind of mistakes and avoid them. So now let's go look at some real examples from real vulnerabilities.